We have been given privileged access today to Wentworth Place, uh, until recently home to the great poet John Keats. Uh, indeed, today, the 13th of September, 1820, is the day that he will take his leave of this place, never to return. Though he doesn't know that yet. So let us venture inside through these rooms and see if we can find a sight uh, of the great poet. Ah, he appears to be here. Uh, Mr. Keats? Mr. Keats? Well, he does not seem able to hear us or see us. So this gives us the opportunity uh, perhaps to witness his final musings uh, on his time here. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. It has been a curious, painful summer. I took lodgings in Kentish Town in May, near Lee Hunt. His wife benefits too from the airs in that place, said to be good for the consumptive. My doctors have advised me to avoid the great excitement of poetry at this time. And yet I have heard many things about my dearest girl, Fanny Braun, and how she went to a dance unchaperoned. I wrote to her, If you still behave in dancing rooms and other societies as I have seen you, I do not want to live. But then I thought again, no, I speak funny. I am wrong. I do not want you to be unhappy. And yet I do. I must. Although is so sweet a beauty, my loveliest, my darling, I kiss you. Ah, the torment. My latest book of poems was published in July, and this meant for at least revision, if not creation. Lamia needed a deal of work to it, as I had not assigned the correct qualities to many of the Greek names in it, leading to problems with scansion and rhyme. Went to visit my sister at Mr. Abbey's in June, too. But had to abandon my attempt as my mouth filled with blood on the coach journey. And I suffered a violent and heavy hemorrhage later that night, so that Hunt took me into his own lodgings, and I came under a Dr. George Darling, who bled me and ordered me to Italy. To Italy. Ah. There is no doubt that an English winter would put an end to me, and do so in a lingering, hateful manner. Therefore, I must either voyage or journey to Italy as a soldier marches up to a battery. Now rooms with the sun upon them become intolerable. And the apothecary's apprentice, with a bitterness greater than aloes, thinks of the pond he used to bathe in at school. The last two years taste like brass upon my palate. And yet, my book has met with a chorus of acclaim so unlike the carping criticism I have received in the past, even the Edinburgh Review has praised it. 
That book has had good success among literary people, and, I believe, has a moderate sale. But then last month, in August, an incident at Hunt's, where a letter from my dearest girl was not delivered to me for two days, and then came to me with its seal broken. Who had read our private words? Some servant. It led me to tears and trembling. And a return to Wentworth, to Hampstead, where Mrs. Braun has taken me in, aware of our engagement. Back at Wentworth Place. Now I live so close to my dearest girl that if only I was well, all would be well. But a fortnight ago I suffered another most severe hemorrhage and have been nursed here by my dearest girl, though in danger of my life. In this state, it means but little to me. I wrote to Hayden and told him that if I do not get well soon, I will cut my throat and there will be an end to it. There is a good doctor in Rome, so they say, a Dr. Clark. So that is where I will go. I have written to my sister and told her that I am very impatient to be aboard, abroad as the sea air is said to be of great benefit to me. My present intention is to spend some time in Naples and then proceed to Rome, where I shall find several friends, or at least several acquaintances. I'm the good doctor. left no immortal works behind me. Nothing to make my friends proud of my memory. But I have loved the principle of beauty in all things. And if I had had time, I would have made myself remembered. Perhaps we should leave Mr. Keats to his thoughts and uh, make a journey of our own. For I am concerned, and I do not know if Mr. Keats will be making this journey by himself or if he will have a companion for his voyage. Perhaps Charles Brown, uh, for example, uh, for he has been a good friend to Mr. Keats. They have written a play together. They have walked in Scotland together and indeed have domiciled here at Wentworth Place for some time. I would hate to think of Mr. Keats having to make the journey alone. Well, I do not think he has the constitution to bear it. But hold hard, there appears to be someone else here. It is I, Joseph Seven, artist. I've been asked to attend upon Mr. Keats for his journey to Italy. I pray that it returns his health. I still remember our initial meeting. Keats was so gifted, with a bright imagination and such charming manners, that I felt lifted to the third heaven. Thus a new world was opened up to me, and I was raised from the mechanical drudgery of my art to a hope of brighter and more elevated courses. 
I've come to know him well over the last few years. We have oft times walked across the heath of Hampstead and shared many spirited discussions on art, history and poetry. I have been quite amazed at his ability to enter into the identity of all he encountered with a remarkable faculty of observation and feeling. Indeed, I would frequently bring my miniatures to finish at Hampstead, nominally to get backgrounds for them, but really for the pleasure of his company. They were my excuse for obtruding my miniature self on his superior society. Together we visited picture exhibitions and sculpture galleries of the British Museum, where I would talk of line and colour and composition, and he of ancient history and classical literature, of which I was quite ignorant. We both received similar bruising criticism from the critics. Keats, despite his remarkable work, was at first described as a vulgar cockney poetaster, an apothecary who should return to the shop. And I, despite receiving the gold medal from the Royal Academy for my Cave of Despair, a painting about which Keats was most enthusiastic, have also been lambasted and vilified for being self-taught and not properly trained or apprenticed. His latest volume has been far better received. Let us hope he can enjoy it. I have painted him too. One night he was missed from the company at the large house they call the Spaniards, and I went to look for him, and I found him laying on the ground under the pines, listening in trance to the song of a nightingale overhead. My painting is an exact illustration of this episode. He's also allowed me to place a miniature that I painted of him in an exhibition at the Academy, despite initial reservations. I've seen little of him since his hemorrhage and his doctor's orders to go to Italy. He, he sought Charles Brown as his companion for this journey, but Brown was in the Highlands and perhaps did not receive his letters in time. And then, just a few days ago, I was visited by Mr. Haslam, who said to me, as nothing can save Keats but going to Italy, why should you not try to go with him? For otherwise he must go alone. And we shall hear nothing of him if he dies. Well, of course, I set about arranging my, my, my orders from the very moment he requested me, much to my father's displeasure. Yes, I fear there will be a scene at home before my departure. But what else can I do? Thus far, art has not made my fortune though my miniatures have proved popular. I may say that of all I have done, by brush or pen, as artist or man, scarce anything will long outlast me. For as Keats himself might say, writ in water indeed in my best deeds, as well as my worst failures. Yet through Keats, I will be remembered. In the hearts of all, who revere my beloved Keats. There will be a corner of loving memory for me. And so we have now met Mr Keats and Joseph Seven, his travelling companion. But there is one who will be sorely afflicted by the news of his departure. For though Keats first found Fanny Braun to be a minx, monstrous in her behaviour, and with a penchant for acting stylishly, which tired him, she has become much more, his muse, his love, for now they are engaged, and, most recently, his nurse. Let us see if we can find her within. Ah, there she is. She appears to be reading a letter. For myself, I know not how to express my devotion to so fair a form. I want a brighter word than bright a fairer word than fair. I almost wish we were butterflies and lived but three summer days. Three such days with you I could fill with more delight than fifty common years could ever contain. You cannot conceive how I ache to be with you. 
how I would die for one hour for what is in the world. I say you cannot conceive. It is impossible you should look with such eyes upon me as I have upon you. It cannot be. <sighs> Knowing well that my life must be passed in fatigue and trouble, I have been endeavouring to wean myself from you. For to myself alone, what can be much of a misery? But I cannot cease to love you. I love you too much not to venture to Hampstead. I feel it is not paying a visit, but venturing into a fire. Oh, such words he has written me. If he were not convinced in my love, he would die in agony. My recovery of bodily health will be of no benefit to me if you are not all mine when I am well. And yet on my birthday, but a month ago, he wrote, To be happy with you seems such an impossibility. It requires a luckier star than mine, it will never be. But since then, a letter of mine was given to him two days late and with a broken seal. For fearing my words had been read by others, he quite broke down and somehow made his way to Wentworth Place, where my mother, seeing his wretched condition, took him in. He has remained here amongst us ever since, and has declared these the only days when his mind has been at ease. And yet, with his illness, I have seen him in transports of agony, in the weakness of body, and I hope I hope beyond all things that his health might be restored by this voyage to Italy and that he might return to me and we can at last embark upon our life together. Engaged as we are, I am brought ever closer to the family, as he has requested that I write on occasion to his sister while he is abroad. Please God that I might be able to communicate bright tidings to her. But if you had passage on Maria Crowther, I will see you peace and power walk. And so the time for his departure grows ever closer. I pray that as it does so, so does the time for his return. My dearest girl, I must take my leave. And so this is farewell. Come with me. The letters. I hope you'll write to me. You will not forget to write to my sister. I use this to cool my hands when I do needlework. It is something I have touched every day, and so by touching it, you will be able to imagine my hand in yours. It is also a practical source of relief from fever. Dearest girl, raise your spirit. We will be married on my return. And thou shalt return with thy friend, the Nightingale. The coach will soon be leaving, Mr. Keats.
and so Mr. Keats left Hampstead. <clears throat> and I rather think you ought to go too. I have a letter to write to his sister. <clears throat> 